Thank you, Pastor Carter and Pastor David and all the other pastors involved for giving us this beautiful opportunity. If you have your Bibles, please turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 52. If you don't have a Bible, sit next to a Christian. Um, and uh, I'll read this from the message translation for you. And a very simple passage, and I want to share my journey of faith. And I pray that this is going to transform your journey of faith today. Read from verse 46 onwards. They spent some time in Jericho. As Jesus was leaving town, trailed by his disciples and a parade of people, a blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting alongside the road. When he heard that Jesus the Nazarene was passing by, he began to cry out, Son of David, Jesus, mercy, have mercy on me. Many tried to hush him up, but he yelled all the louder, Son of David, mercy, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped in his tracks, called him over. They called him, it's your day, get up. He's calling you to come. Throwing off his coat, he was on his feet at once and came to Jesus. Now Jesus said, what can I do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. On your way, said Jesus, your faith has saved and healed you. In that very instant, he recovered his sight and followed Jesus down the road. It's an amazing passage. And there's so much of similarity between this man and me. Bartimus, Bar means son and Timius means unclean. So the meaning of this man's name is son of unclean. I can't think of anyone having a much more hopeless start on this planet earth than this man. Just imagine he gets up in the morning. It's a good morning unclean. How are you unclean? Did you clean yourself unclean? You look unclean unclean. You see, just having a wrong name is enough to tarnish your image. And here is a man who had a name that was not nice at all. He was blind. He has physical challenges. Three, he was a beggar, not a glorified occupation. So he was a complete hopeless person. When I look at my life, when I grew up, I grew up as a hopeless person. I was the example of what it means to be a hopeless person. My teachers would tell the students, if you want to become like Benny, then don't study. So I was the perfect example of what it means to be hopeless. It was so difficult when I grew up because I was compared. I, I was born to an, uh, to an amazing family. My father was an aerospace scientist and being the first born in the family, I was expected to become like my father. Even though medically you can't prove that every first born son will not have the same brains like the father, but I was expected in my society. I was pushed, compared, Everything was done and I could not. It was so hard that I did not have a proper childhood. And on top of that, I was born with asthma. And from the age of two till the age of 16, I was on wrong medication. And as a result of that, 60% of my lungs got damaged. My immune system broke down and I developed rheumatoid arthritis. And that is because of somebody else's mistake. Sometimes we suffer because of somebody else's mistake. And that's when we say, God, where are you? If you were really there, why did this happen to me? My wife could have asked the same question. God, if you were there, why did you allow this man to come and destroy my future? I had that question. I said, God, if you were there, why did the doctors give me wrong medication? So I grew up with this stigma of being a sickly, broken, useless, depressed child. You see, in our culture in India, they humiliate in public and they appreciate in secret. And here when I grew up, you know, the teachers would treat me so bad, not because they were evil, but that's what the culture taught. They could treat me any way they want because anyway I'm useless. Anyway I'm a cursed child to the society so they can treat me any way they want. I still remember, I would never show any part of my body. I would always cover completely. The only portion you would ever see was my face and my hands, not even my arms. I was so ashamed of myself. 
There were 35 classmates that I had, 35 boys and girls in my class. I was 13 years old in my ninth grade. The biology teacher, she forgot to bring the skeleton map. And she needed a volunteer. For her, it didn't even bother, strike her mind that Benny is a human. He has emotions. It didn't bother for her. So she forced me in front of the entire class. I was a guy, I would not even show my arm. And she forced me to take off my shirt and my bare body. She asked every student to come and count the number of ribs on my body. And, and it was so painful, so humiliating. I had no self-esteem, nothing. And that also showed. And even I can't even call my parents because they would say, Benny, if you did well in your studies, no teacher will treat you like that. So it was always based on performance and always based on, you know, you do this, then your result will be like this. And it was so hard growing up, trying to keep up to these expectations. And some of us might be still stuck in those things. And at 16, I was completely shattered when the doctors gave me six months to live. So I know what it means to be hopeless like this man. And when they gave me six months to live, I said, why should I even live in this world? What is there? I'd rather die early than wait for six months. Because anyway, I'm useless to the family, useless to the school. In fact, the school, they called my parents and said, please take your son off this school because we have never ever had a single failure and your son is going to create history by being the first ever failure of the school. <laughs> so this is who I was. I had no value, no identity, no health, no education, nothing. The only good thing I was good at was something that nobody should do. I was very good in forging signatures. I was so good that nobody could catch me. I forged my father's signature because he refused to sign because out of 100, I always got single digits. I was very consistent in getting single digit marks. And I forged my mother's signature. I forged my principal's signature till one day all the three met together and I got caught. But this is who I was. I had no talent, nothing. And might be there's someone sitting here and you have lost hope. You have sat down, you have compared yourself to others. And you think that, why should I even live in this world when anyway, everyone thinks I'm useless. I was in that shoes. And Bartimus was blind, not a nice name. He's a beggar, not a glorified occupation. If Jesus could commend this man's faith, I believe that everyone in this room has no excuse why you should not give Jesus a chance by having faith in him that he can transform you and truly make you the head and not the tail. Now at 16, at the lowest point of my life is when I went to a youth camp. I heard the voice of Jesus Christ. He said, Ben, even though you are called useless, I still want you. I said, why? What would you get out of a broken life? Have you ever seen a company with an advertisement saying useless people wanted? You will never see that. Nowhere. The world is only looking for influential people, useful people. Even friends, sadly, today, it's all based on benefits. So at 16, I could not understand why Jesus wanted a useless, broken guy who's going to die in six months. He said, Benny, you surrender your broken life and I will transform you and make you a new person. But how can I believe that? How can I believe he could change? And that's where faith comes into the picture. In simple language, faith means believing without seeing. Whereas the rational mind says, seeing is believing. Now here, the Bible says that he had a cloak. He threw off his cloak when Jesus asked him to come. And he met Jesus. That's all the action is. There's no much information that can give us insight that why did Jesus commend his faith when all that he did was he threw off his cloak. But you know, when you go back to the historical situation in those days, for you to become a beggar, you have to go through a proper scrutiny. So once they do a medical checkup and find out that you have physical challenges, either you have no eyesight or there's some challenge in your physical body. And once they approve that, then they will give you a special cloak now that cloak was exclusively designed for a beggar. 
When a beggar wore that cloak, it meant that this man was officially authorized and recognized beggar of the government of Israel. So he was not an ordinary beggar. He was an authorized beggar. And the only way you would know is through the cloak. So for him, this cloak was everything. His income, his ID, his career, his future. And imagine when Jesus calls him, the first thing he does, he throws off his cloak. In today's world, we would have folded the cloak, put it under our shoulder, gone and met Jesus. Just in case if I don't receive my eyesight, I can always go back to my old (laughs) profession. That is called plan B and plan C. But I'll tell you, faith in Christ, there is no room for plan B. Because the Bible says, God is not a man that he lies, nor a son of man who changes his mind. When we have a God who does not cheat, who does not lie, who does not change his mind, why do we doubt? But sometimes we don't have the patience to wait for his timing. And here is a man who threw off his cloak, he jumped up, he met Jesus. And what I've learned is that faith is needed before the miracle, not after the miracle. After the miracle, it is a testimony. It's a story to tell the world. But faith is needed before. And some of you are sitting and saying, God, if you do these things, I will follow you. No, you follow Christ first. And you see that in his time, he will make all things beautiful. So at 16, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I asked him to come by faith, even though I have six months to live. And he says, I'll give you abundant life. You know, these verses are so nice when it is only a designer. But once it comes into a practical situation of your life, that's where you need faith to believe that this beautiful verse on the wall can become real to me. This beautiful scripture, the Bible, can become very much a practical solution for my life, a spiritual solution for my life. And so I said, okay, Jesus, I'll give you my life. At 16, I gave my broken life into his hands. And he started off a new walk. First thing I learned was I was intentionally created. I was not a mistake, even though my academic reports say that I was a mistake. I was a mistake because my brother and three sisters were so good. So when you have one odd person in the family, naturally you become the mistake. When you have a father who can speak such wonders that within two minutes I get confused what he's trying to explain. No, just, I have to just ask him one question. How does the plane fly? He'll give me a two-hour lecture. <laughs> and I cannot understand. When you have such a smart father and you are not able to do anything, you think you're a mistake. And here, first thing I believe that God intentionally designed. He created me in his image. That was such a big revelation because that was the key for me to give God a chance for me to live in this world. So I started off my walk with Jesus. And my dream was to go to one country. That was my ultimate dream in my life. Is I said, God, I wish I can sit in an aeroplane and fly someday. I was not even bothered if the plane would land. I just wanted to take off. That's it. (laughs) You know, that was my, my concern. I said, I wish I can just take off. You know, and... And I went to Jesus and when I started to read the Bible and he says, Benny, I have plans for you not to harm you, but to prosper you, you know, nice scriptures. But I wondered, can these scriptures become real in my life? Is all the verses in the Bible relevant for me as an ordinary broken Indian? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So I believed in him. And I said, okay, God, but what is your dream for my life? This is my dream, is to go to one country before I die. And in 2002, I asked Jesus, what is your dream? He says, Benny, my dream for you is to travel to every country by 2010. And I paused and I said, God, I think you have mistaken me to somebody else. (laughs) Because I can prove to you why this is impossible. We know that God is a master of impossibility. Not like, for example, the Jericho Wall. You see, you would expect either a bomb or something to come and bring the walls down. The last thing you would expect is sing some songs and go around and shout and what an eco-friendly way to bring the walls down, you know. (laughs) But, But that is God. He is a master of doing the impossible. We know that. But the question is, do you know that he can do it for you? And for me, I said, God, are you sure? 
Then I sat down with four reasons why this is impossible. You know, as a human, we rationally explained to God. I said, I have $25 a month being a YWAM missionary. So that kind of a budget is not enough to travel. Two, I have an Indian passport. And at that time, I already had a rejected stamp from the US and from UK. I said, God, you have given me the wrong passport. I said, you have given me the right vision, but the wrong passport. Or you have given me the right passport and the wrong vision. And thirdly, my health is so weak. I told him, you see, you have given me the wrong body. I was hit by a javelin at the age of 12. So I have a problem with my spine. I can't sit in a position for more than half an hour. I said, you have given me the wrong body. Are you sure that things like this could work? And finally, I said, look at history. I don't even have an example to follow. You know, many times today, we look up for role models. We look up, if that guy can do, I can do it. But I did not have a role model. I did not have an example because till today in the history, there's never ever been a musician who's been to every country. Whether it is Michael Jackson or Justin Bieber or Shakira, whoever it is. <laughs> not one single musician on this planet Earth has been to every country. And I said, God, are you sure? He says, Benny, what is impossible for man is possible for me. I said, God, I know that, but are you sure you can do that with me? And maybe some of you are asking that question today. Can God do that with me? I'll tell you, just don't be good hearers of stories of faith. I pray that you will have your own story of faith today. And Jesus looks at you equally the same. So I gave my life and my dreams into Jesus' hands. And I said, okay, Jesus, let this be your plan. I will be your traveler and you be my provider. So I made a commitment that I will never ask for money, will never borrow money, will never take a loan from the bank or trust the credit card. And I started off my journey. And today, this is my one passport that uh, some of you have not seen before and it's grown a bit now. So even my hands are get, just getting full. So this is my one passport. And I'll tell you that uh, my, my favorite part of carrying this passport till today, I still don't miss out this expression, is when I put it in front of the immigration officer. You must see, when I put my passport across, you know, suddenly he is confused. No, he's, he doesn't know what to do. And some of the smart ones would come up by saying, don't come as a family, just come one person at a time. And when I tell them that, you know, this is one person, they are amazed. They say, how could you do it? What did you do? How, how was this possible? What do you do for a living? Some of the officers get the access to check my bank account and they'll say, when we tally your bank account and your passport, it's not possible at all. That's when I tell them, you know what? Jesus told me to do this and he provided. I still remember one lady officer of the Atlanta airport. She came up to me in the end and she said, I wish Jesus can provide for me like the way he provides for you. You see, you become an example to the society. No matter how big and strong and great they are, you can be a living example. Jesus did this. But I'll tell you what, there are challenges in life too. When I look at my first passport, I did not have a glorious start. All of us wish that we can do those three-point prayer and God will answer. Sometimes we even give a time limit for God by saying, God, you, I'll give you three days and I want you to answer in three days. Who are we to give time limit for God? He is the potter and I'm the clay. Can I ever tell him? No, but I'll tell you, he's a good father. He, he thinks the best for us. If an earthly father knows how to give good gifts for their son or a daughter, how much more your heavenly father? He is a good father. Whatever you're going through, hold on. Hold on to Jesus. And if you have never given your life to Jesus, I would highly recommend you because this Jesus is the one who transformed my life. And at 16, when I had no hope, no future, no friends, he caught off me and he gave me this future. So I said, okay, Jesus, but I'll tell you, when I look at my first passport, 19th of February, 2002, is when I took my first flight as a concert artist and I went from Delhi to Moscow. For all my Russian friends, I still love you, but this is my story. <laughs> and when I arrived 
when I arrived in Moscow, a fresh new passport, tiny Indian guy. With this plan, God saying, I'm going to take you to every country in the world. They asked me for a bribe of $50. But I'm a Christian and I'm an Indian. I don't give a bribe. You know, you don't even have to pray about it. The answer is no, right? So I refused to pay a bribe. And I was waiting for God to move. Nothing happened. Instead, they detained me in the airport for 30 hours. For 30 hours, I was treated like a criminal, humiliated. And here, God has a plan, you know, to travel to every country in the world. And I'm stuck in my first journey. After 30 hours, they came up to me and they said, we have decided to deport you back to India. What a glorious opening ceremony I had. <laughs> but you see, some of us, we are at the verge of quitting because we have become impatient. Or we are at the verge of quitting because we think that a disappointment or a defeated situation is the answer that God is not on my side. No. Today when I look at this passport, I've learned that don't allow your starting to shape the way you finish. Don't allow your beginning to shape the way you end. But the Bible says, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. Can you put your faith in Christ today regardless of what you're going through? Faith is not based on your circumstances. It is based on the character of God. He's a loving father. Hold on. Surrender your life. And I believe that in time, in his time, as you hold on to him, he will do that miracle that the world will be amazed. Look at it. And on 22nd of November 2010, I arrived in my last country, Pakistan, and I broke six world records. And one of them is I became the fastest man in the world to travel to every country in the shortest time. 245 nations at the time, including Antarctica, in six years, six months, and 22 days. See, Jesus provided. He gave me the strength. He gave me the wisdom. He gave me everything that was needed. You know, at one point, I was ashamed to my family. I was ashamed to my school. But I remember when, when God gave this, he wrote history out of a broken life. See, some people read history, some people write history. But I believe that God calls us to be history makers, to make history. I remember when I went to Pitcairn Island. It is the most remote country. It's a dependency of UK. When I checked, you know, from the nearest airport, it takes two days by boat, but the boat is available only once in three months. <laughs> and when I was getting ready to go there, and they informed me and they said, Sir, the concert that you're going to perform is going to be the first concert in 200 years. I said, Wow, that is very historical. When I arrived there at the concert venue, they said, This is the largest gathering we have ever had. Now, I come from a country with 1.3 billion people. And if you say largest gathering, that's a bit disturbing. How can so many people gather? When I asked them, what do you mean? They said, the entire population of the country is 66 people. <laughs> right? And, and 52 people have come for the concert, which means 80% of the country that has come for the concert. <laughs> no? But you see, from a broken, written off life, where people thought I was worthless, where at 16 I even contemplated to commit suicide, I surrendered my broken life into the hands of Jesus. I threw off that cloak of unbelief, of fear, of failure. And I surrendered my broken life into his hands. And Jesus transformed my life. And he gave me this new start. He gave me this journey to travel to every country. 257 countries I've been to. There's no more countries left for me to travel. <laughs> and today as I play this song on the pan flute, this song is my tribute by Andre Crouch. I just want to challenge you, challenge your thinking. You see, I, I was uh, invited to play at the Paralympic Games in London in 2012. So I asked Jesus, how are you going to use me at the Paralympic Games? That's when he said, Benny, I want you to go and pick up a brand new instrument, the pan flute. And I said, God, you know I only have 40% lungs. And wind instrument is not the right instrument. You see, sometimes we feel like updating God with the latest problems <laughs> as though he doesn't know about it. And he says, I know that, Benny, but I, 
then he said, if I could use five loaves of bread and two fish to feed 5,000, don't you think I can also use 40% lungs to play the pan flute? Ever since then, I stopped giving ideas to God how to do a miracle. <laughs> I'll tell you, I prayed by faith. I bought this instrument. And uh, in six days, I was able to learn to play this instrument. And within a month's time, I ended up playing at the Paralympic Games with 40% lungs. And two years ago, I went for a complete medical checkup. And the doctor said, your asthma is still very severe. But the amazing part is that your lungs have regrown from 40% to 95%. And so I challenge you. Faith is needed before the miracle, not after the miracle. Some of you are struggling in that. My prayer, as I play this song, to God be the glory. And I, I pray and I challenge you and I urge you that you would put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I believe that in his time, he will do that amazing miracle, that breakthrough that you are praying for.